Hello everyone and happy holidays. Christmas was three days ago. You look silly. Now I use Unity pretty much every day, and for the most part, I really enjoy it. But there is one big exception to that rule, and that is the input system. The input system has always been fine when it comes to just quickly slapping something together. But as soon as you want to start using multiple controllers, do customizable input, or just use more than a few buttons, things start to get really cumbersome. So today we'll take a look at a very early version of the new input system that Unity is working on. But first, this video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has server locations in over 90 different countries and is the fastest VPN provider out there. By using a VPN, you increase your security, anonymity, and it protects you from hackers. ExpressVPN even uses a strong 256-bit encryption to help protect all your data. For me, one of the biggest perks has been that it lets me stream The Office, which isn't available in my country. So thanks to ExpressVPN for allowing me to experience Dwight in HD. A membership is less than $7 a month and they even offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description. Also, special thanks to Andrew Kilnenko, Rudy Indravanto, Art Armin, John Shannon, Alex Jarotsky, Alexander Blair, and Infinity PPR for their support on Patreon. Before we get started, I just want to say that the new system is still very much a work in progress, and so you'll probably notice some weird behavior here and there. That being said, I think it looks like a very promising upgrade to the old system, especially when it comes to interface. It's currently available on GitHub and has been quite a while actually. So let's jump right into it. So first we of course want to install the new input system. Currently this is done via GitHub, but I imagine that we'll see some kind of beta release through the package manager at the start of 2019. I'll of course have a link to this in the description. You can either clone it or simply hit cloner download and download it as a zip file. I've just gone ahead and opened up the project here and created a very simple scene with just a main camera, a light, and this player object, which is just a cube. And on this cube, I have a player script, which is currently just completely empty. So to start adding input to our game, we first need to create an input asset. So if we right click in the project here and go create, we can go to the bottom where it says input actions. If we click this, we can give it a name. I'm just going to call it something like input master. This will take care of all the input in this example. We can then double click this asset and it's going to open up in a separate window. I'm just going to dock this by the game view. And as we can see, this window is made up of three parts, action maps, actions, and then properties. We'll go through these one by one. Let's start with action maps. So action maps are basically categories for actions. You could create an action map for your player, one for your menu, one for vehicles, and so on. Let's go ahead and create a new one for our player. Now under this action map, we can create actions and actions are basically like events. Examples of actions could be shooting, it could be movement, it could be reloading or bringing up a menu. Let's go ahead and create a new action here. Let's call this one shoot. Now as you can see, once I have an action selected, we can adjust properties over here in the properties window. This is pretty much like the inspector for actions. However, under each action, there's actually one more thing that we can create. These are bindings. And bindings are basically like triggers for actions. So let's create a binding here for a shoot. And with this selected, we can go to the right here and under binding, we can select a key. And here we can search for anything. I'm just gonna search for the space bar. As you can see here, there's one called space and this is under the keyboard device. Let's click that. And now we've bound the space key to the shoot action. So every time we press space, the shoot action is going to be called. However, you often want multiple keys to do the same thing. And we can actually really easily do that here. If we want another button to do shooting as well, we can simply add another binding. And we could, for example, bind this to mouse click. So we'll search for mouse. And now we get all the mouse input options. We could input stuff like position or scroll here, or simply use the left button. So now we can either shoot using space on the keyboard or left button on the mouse. Let's go ahead and add another action. So we'll hit the plus sign on the actions. And let's call this one movement. And depending on your game, you might want to move in multiple directions. And a nice thing about the old system was that we could use this input.get axis to simply get a value for each axis that specified in what direction we were traveling and how quickly. And we can actually set up the same behavior here really easily using multiple bindings. However, instead of having to go in and create a bunch of bindings, we can actually create these automatically using either a composite axis or a composite D-pad. The composite axis is going to use one axis. So it's going to go between negative and positive on this axis, just like you would get axis horizontal or vertical. 
or we could use create composite d-pad to move in four directions. But before we start binding these keys, we need to think about what control scheme we are using. So currently everything that we are setting up here is for keyboard and mouse. However, a lot of the time you want to be able to support both keyboard and mouse, game pads of different sorts, maybe you want to do touch controls, and we of course need a way to configure this in our input system. We can do that really easily using control schemes. In the left top hand corner here, you can see it currently says no control scheme. Let's go ahead and add a new control scheme instead. And it's going to open up this window. And this might be one of those weird behavior things I was talking about because it really shouldn't appear over here, I don't think. But nonetheless, we can go ahead and create a scheme name. And this could be keyboard and mouse. We can then add a device that we want to use with this control scheme. And for some reason, the list of devices is only shown on my secondary monitor and I'm unable to move it. But I promise you, it shows a list of devices and we can search for the one we want. I'm just going to search for keyboard and add it. And we can now see it on the list. And we also want to add a mouse here. And we can now see that we've added both a keyboard and a mouse device. And let's now hit add to create this control scheme. If we then go to the top, we can add another control scheme. This one is going to be gamepad. And let's then add the gamepad device. Let's hit add. And we've now created two control schemes, keyboard and mouse and the gamepad. If we select no control scheme, it's just going to show all of them. So for our first two actions here, we want to make sure to select these as keyboard and mouse. And let's also do that for the four movement ones we just created. And now we should see that when we switch to the keyboard and mouse scheme, all of our bindings for the actions show. Let's also add some keys to these bindings. So for up here, we'll choose up arrow. For down, we'll select down arrow. Same for left and right. And let's rename this binding here to arrow keys. In fact, let's create another set of bindings here. So let's create another composite D-pad. And let's call this one vast keys. Under up, let's go ahead and bind W. Down, let's bind S. A for left and D for right. And let's set all of these to use the keyboard and mouse control scheme. And we should now see that if we change our control scheme up here to keyboard and mouse, everything still looks the same. However, if we switch to gamepad, we still see both of the actions, but all the bindings disappear because the bindings aren't set for the gamepad. Instead, we can go in here and create our own bindings for the gamepad. So let's go and add a binding for shoot. And this could be something like button west, and it automatically goes under gamepad now. For movement, we could create a d-pad, and up here we'll search for d-pad. So d-pad up, d-pad down, left, and right. We can also see that for each one of these bindings, we can add processors. And these will help you configure the input. So if we want to invert it, clamp it, normalize it, adjust the sensitivity, we can do stuff like that here using processors. Now let's switch back to keyboard and mouse. And it looks like we're now ready to integrate this with our gameplay. So let's save the asset here. And one thing that is really nice about the new system when working with it through code is that it allows us to generate a c -sharp class based on our input configuration. What this saves us from is using a bunch of strings to get the right actions based on their names. This is something the old system was definitely suffering from and it's nice to see that Unity is working around this. And you definitely still have the possibility to use strings if you'd rather do that. Now to generate a C-sharp class, we just have to toggle that here. And we don't need to fill out any of these variables, we can simply hit apply. And as you can see, Unity is now going to create an input master C-sharp script next to our input master asset. We don't need to make any modifications to this. We can actually open it up and change it if we would like to. This is just generated code from Unity. Now let's open up our player script. And as you can see here, it's a completely new script. Let's just get rid of the two default methods here. And at the top here, we want to be using Unity Engine dot experimental. And this is of course going to go away dot input. Now the first thing that we want is of course a reference to the input asset we just created. And because we've made it generate a C sharp class based on this asset, we can actually just create a variable of type input master. So let's create a public input master and let's call it controls. Now, if we just quickly create a function here, let's create a void awake. And if you've never used awake before, it's just like start, except it's called even before start is called. So it's really good to use for setup. Now in here, if we write controls and then go dot, we can actually access our player action map. And if we press dot again, we can see the different actions under this map. We can see movement and shoot here. If we go shoot and then write dot performed, we can choose what happens when this shoot action is triggered. So when any of the keys bound to this action is pressed, then we can choose what happens. 
And let's go ahead and create a function for that. So let's create some kind of void. Let's call it shoot. And let's just right now throw out a debug.log saying we shot the sheriff. So now we can simply take this method and register it to this button. To do that, we go plus equals. And the syntax here is a bit weird if you've never worked with delegates or events, but think of it like we're adding this function to a list of functions that should be called whenever this action is triggered. And because the system is so cold, it actually gives us some context as to what is happening with this button. We're not gonna be using this information here, but we actually still need to write it. So let's create some kind of variable called context. And again, the syntax here is weird. We then do equals and then a greater than sign. And then we specify the function. So in our case, this is going to be shoot. Again, bear with the weird syntax here. You can call this variable anything you'd like. You can call it context or because we're not gonna be using it, we could just do an underscore here. And then it just looks like we're kind of adding this shoot method to this list. Think of it like that for now. And this should actually properly trigger our function. However, we do need to first enable our input master. So because this system is so modular and we wanna be able to swap in and out different input assets, and we wanna switch between control schemes and all that, we can basically enable and disable all parts of the system. In our case here, we just wanna enable our controls. So let's create a void on enable. So whenever this game object is enabled, let's also enable our controls. So we can do controls dot enable. And let's do the same thing for disabling. So let's create a void on disable and let's just write controls dot disable. So now the controls are going to turn on and off together with this object, which is fine for now. And now we can actually save this, go into Unity, Let's select our player and let's drag in the input master asset, not the generated script. And now when we hit play, we should see that if I press the mouse button here, indeed it prints, we shut the sheriff. And the same thing happens if I press space. You'll also see that it triggers twice each time. One for when I press the button and one for when I release it. To get rid of this, we can go under our input master. We can find the button and under interactions, we can choose press. And let's do the same thing for our left button here. So now it's only going to trigger on press and not on release. Let's save that and try replaying. And indeed, I now have to press each time we want it to display and nothing is going to happen on release. Awesome. But how do we handle the more complicated case with movement where we are able to travel in all kinds of directions for one particular action? Well, this is where the context is extremely cool. So let's go ahead and create a function here for what we want to happen with movement. So let's create a void, let's call it move. And in here, let's throw another debug.log saying something like player wants to move. Well, we can of course register this in the exact same way as with the suit function. So let's do controls.player.movement.performed plus equals. Let's write context this time, CTX, the weird syntax here, and then move. And now if we save that and go into Unity and play, and I'm just gonna use the arrow keys here, we can see that the player wants to move each time I press one of the arrow keys and the same thing for the vast keys. However, this has no indication of which one of the arrow keys we're pressing. And so we don't know what direction. To specify this, we can go in and let's first of all add this as an argument to our move function. So let's create some kind of vector two and let's call this direction. And then when we're debug the logging here, we can maybe create a bit of space and add on the direction to this message. So now we should be printing the direction that we want to move in. And the only thing that we need to change up here is that we now need to use our context to specify what direction we want to move in. And luckily we can do that really easily. If we do context dot, we can get all kinds of information about what's happening with this event. So we can see the action that got triggered we can see the control that triggered the action, the duration, stuff about interaction, the phase, and we can also read a value. So if we do dot read value here, and we specify that we wanna read a vector two value and open and close some parentheses, well now we're basically feeding the value of our input into the move function. And so we can simply access it down here as direction. And if we save that and go into Unity and play, we can see that if I move to the right here, it goes one zero. If I go left, it goes minus one zero. If I go up, it goes zero one. And if I go down, it goes zero minus one. And I can combine these to create kind of smooth input in different directions. 
And this works with both the arrow keys and the vast input. If I connected a gamepad and tried this out, it would work in just the same way. Awesome. So that's how you can create really complex input scenarios fairly easily using the new input system. However, a lot of the time, especially when just messing around, you don't want to go through all these steps of first doing something in the UI and then hooking it up through script. This is a really good way of doing things, but sometimes you just want to check for a button press. And to do this really easily, we can actually get rid of all this stuff. Let's just say we want to check for a press in the update method. Let's create an update method. And the easiest way to do this is using input system dot get device and here we could get any device so in our case we want to get something on the keyboard and let's just store this in a quick variable type keyboard and let's just call it kb and then we can simply check if kb dot space key dot was pressed this frame well then let's go ahead and debug that log someone pressed space and let's save that go into unity and play and now every time i press space that message is going to appear so you can see there's plenty of opportunity for using this system through code as well. Awesome. That's pretty much it for this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a future one. Also make sure to check out ExpressVPN. Simply click the link in the description to find out how you can get three months for free. And if you haven't already checked out our new store for game dev clothing, definitely make sure to do so. Simply go to lineofcode.io and grab a shirt you like. On that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the new year, which is gonna be fun. Yeah. <laughs> thanks to all the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in November, and a special thanks to Make a Game, Andrew Kalinenko, Art Armin, Two VR Systems, Alexander Blair, Infinity PBR, Cyborg Mummy, Dennis Sullivan, Sheriff Abdullah, Chris, Faisal Marify, Thanks So Long, Leo Lasset, Clinton Fenskewer, Shreya D, Ronin, Bruins Cat, Naoki Iwasaki, Gregory Pierce, Larry Tweed, Cool Swedish Key, James Rogers, Rob Farron, Corey Jackson, Pacom Bernier, Robert Bund, Erasmus, Anthony Patton, Obrisi, James P, Timo Folderbach, John Shannon, Alex Jarotsky, Travis Dillon, Rudy and Travanto and Carsten Suerland. You guys rock!